Hello, thank you for joining us today to discuss some exciting data with Context Therapeutics. Management's prepared remarks will be followed by a brief Q&A. Please welcome our presenters, Eric Boots, Scientific Lead, Dr. Joe Rucker, Research Lead, and Martin Lair, Chief Executive Officer. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom panel. We'll do our best to address as many questions as time allows. Really appreciate everyone joining today. Uh, the team is currently live uh, in Orlando, Florida at the American Association for Cancer Research annual meeting. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with AACR, it is the largest early stage oncology meeting, meaning preclinical through typically phase one clinical trials, uh, where the latest, newest groundbreaking research is presented. And this morning at the event, we had a poster presentation with our most recent preclinical data for our lead program, CTIM76, our bispecific antibody targeting Claudin6 and CD3. So before again, I would encourage everyone to review our disclosure statement in any forward-looking statements that we may make during this presentation. So I thought it'd be helpful just to spend a minute talking about CTIM76, what it is. Uh, CTIM76 is a bispecific antibody. The structure is presented here on the left portion of the slide. For those of you unfamiliar with bispecific antibodies, they are antibodies, which are uh, proteins that our bodies make to uh, address and fight pathogens. Uh, and in this case, uh, a typical antibody is monoclonal, meaning it binds to the same protein on both arms of the antibody. And the arms would be the portions in the top right and left of the Y-looking like structure. In our case, we modified a typical antibody and converted it to a bispecific, meaning it binds to two different proteins. In this case, we wanted to therapeutically exploit the concept of immunotherapy. So with one arm of the antibody, we bind to Claudin-6, which is enriched in many different types of tumors, as well as a second arm that activates CD3, which is expressed on immune cells. And the idea is to bring immune cells in close proximity to the cancer cells to get our own immune systems to essentially attack uh, the tumor. There are some really interesting attributes of this program, uh, particularly our hopes that it will have a wide therapeutic window. That would be the difference between the efficacious dose that would have an impact on the tumor and tumor biology versus unwanted safety. And so our hope is that we can generate very significant efficacy before we would see unwanted side effects. And there are some structural considerations that we'll talk about, about how we design the compound to engender that particular effect. Because we're using an IgG backbone, which is an immunoglobin backbone, that's a well-described, well-understood uh, biological product that's typically administered in patients every two to four weeks uh, in an outpatient setting. So we think it's very flexible uh, for patients and reasonably convenient. And then importantly, uh, we've had great success thus far with our partnership with Lanza, uh, a global uh, manufacturer of complex biologics like CTIM76, uh, where uh, we are currently uh, scaling up manufacturing of this protein to support human trials, and that relationship has gone really well. So to sum this all up, we think we have a really interesting uh, asset uh, that can potentially address Claudin6-driven cancers. And so with that, I'll advance two slides and uh, turn it over to our scientific lead, Dr. Eric Butts. So Claudin-6 is the target of CTIM-76 and is um, associated with worse prognosis in a number of different cancers. Three of them are shown here, and you can see that Claudin-6 high tumor cells have a faster progression and worse um, overall prognosis than Claudin-6 low tumors. Claudin-6 proteins are a family of tight junction proteins um, it's a large family with 27 different proteins having been described, and dysregulation of Claudin-6 proteins occurs in multiple diseases, including a number of different kinds of cancer. Um, normal function would be the uh, red um, molecules in the cartoon on the right-hand side, and where they're shown to be um, gluing cells tightly together to form uh, tight junctions 
and uh, limit traffic of um, molecules across those junctions. Claudin-6 is part of um, the wider Claudin family, and in particular, there are three other closely related Claudins, Claudin-9, Claudin-4, and Claudin-3. And one of the challenges of targeting this is that there's a high degree of similarity between Claudin-6 and the other three Claudins in that, in that group. And uh, while Claudin-6 is an uh, oncofetal tumor antigen, the other three Claudins are uh, widely expressed in normal tissues, and particularly Claudin-3 in the pancreas, Claudin-4 in the kidney and pan pancreas, and uh, Claudin-9 in the ear. So specificity and targeting, targeting Claudin-6 is important to avoid um, off-target toxicities. In particular, we think that Claudin-6 has potential to reach um, patients in a number of um, indications with high unmet need, principally testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, and non-small cell lung cancer, uh, where expression of Claudin-6 is quite high. With testicular cancer, it's in almost all cancers. In ovarian, it's about 60% of ovarian cancers, and in non-small cell lung carcinoma with a pretty high unmet need, uh, about 30% of cells of tumors express Claudin-6. Uh, and here's some staining data that um, backs that up. You can see on the right-hand panel, there's a wide variety of normal tissues which do not express Claudin-6. And on the left-hand side, you see examples of testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer, and high levels of Claudin-6 expression in those cells. Claudin-6, we think, makes a really excellent target for a bispecific antibody. It's tumor-specific, um, at present at high density across um, many cancers. Uh, it's expressed at low le levels or absent from normal tissue. Um, and as uh, uh, Joe Rucker will be explaining here in just a moment, there's quite a bit of complexity in targeting the antigen, which we think we have um, a good reagent to do. And it's closely related to its nearest neighbors, but we have a high degree of specificity. And recently, BioNTech has published um, data from a CAR-T project showing that they had a 50% um, a response rate in uh, their responses to the CAR T cell, um, providing biological proof of concept. Um, but uh, with a bispecific, it would be a much simpler dosing strategy than for a CAR T. So we think C1076 is selective for Claudin 6, potent in in vitro experiments, which Joe will also be providing you some evidence for with the potential for a wide therapeutic window and um, excellent manufacturability because of the backbone structure. Okay, so what, I, what I'm gonna do now is talk about where uh, CTIM 76 came from, and then to talk a little bit about the end, you know, about where it's going. So when we were first beginning this program, we began to first talk about, you know, the, the what arms of the Claudin-6 and the CD3, what should they look like? So in terms of the Claudin-6 targeting arm, we had developed an, an, a high affinity Claudin-6 antibody, but in particular, we got the high affinity, but we're able to maintain very, very high specificity for Claudin-6 uh, against the uh, closely related Claudins, Claudin-3, Claudin-4, and particularly Claudin-9, which only differs from Claudin-6 by three amino acids in the extracellular domains. We thought about the different CD3 engaging arms, and in terms of those arms, we picked arms that were clinically validated, where we had a freedom to operate, but we, we did have a range of potencies that we could choose from when we were uh, scanning through these different possibilities. We chose a variety of formats. We didn't make any assumptions about what format we felt would, would, would work best. So we did uh, bite formats. We did formats where we had a single arms binding Claudin-6 and CD3, arms where we had bivalent Claudin-6 and CD3 binding, and, arm, and, a, and a format where we had bivalent binding to IgG, uh, bivalent binding to Claudin-6, but only monovalent binding to CD3. And so we were able to use all of these to create a very large comprehensive panel of bispecifics to look for the ones, uh, look for the uh, uh, bispecific that gave us the best properties. Just some other factors. Um, of course, we wanted cross-reactivity to non-human primates for both the arms, which would help simplify preclinical studies. 
we used effector function silencing uh, just to make sure that to uh, control immunogenicity. And, you know, for the uh, scaffolds, which had IgG like folds, um, we maintained a uh, um, binding of the neonate um, FC receptor uh, for half life extension. So, our initial panel generation is we took a variety of Claude and six arms, a variety of CD3 arms, mixed it into these variety of bispecific formats, and ended up with 54 candidate molecules. Um, candidate molecules. And we did extensive characterization, uh, functionally, uh, safety profiling, developability, and ended up eliminating, you know, choosing four lead candidates, which uh, had optimal uh, um, properties in all of these three areas. These three candidates were um, a one byte molecule, uh, two molecules that had a one by one format. So an IgG where they had a single arm club six, um, single arm CD3. And the differences between those two were on the club six arms where there were subtle differences in affinity and specificity. And then one final molecule, which was a two by two bivalent for Claudin-6, also bivalent by CD3. And these were arms that we then did extensive characterization uh, to uh, end up choosing a CTIM-76 as our lead candidate. So uh, CTIM-76, which was, uh, once again, is a one by one, we, we looked um, at this in a variety of characterization. Here I'm showing um, um, uh, T-cell directed uh, site, cell cytotoxic, cytotoxicity assays in two different cell lines, and a, a K56 K562 line overexpressing Claudin-6, where CTIM-76 showed uh, sub-picomolar uh, cytotoxicity um, compared to a slightly weaker cytotoxicity with uh, other molecules. We also went into an OV90 cell line as well, also showing a low picomolar, uh, picomolar uh, potency uh, as well. And so in these assays, the CTIM-76 uh, was either equivalent to or uh, superior uh, to the other formats. It was well known that bispecific molecules, CD3 engaging bispecific molecules, um, is CRS, a cytokine release syndrome, can be a, a concern. So we, we did um, extensive cytokine release profiling. And what we show here is that we were, did a direct comparison of CTIM-76 and a bite molecule that had the exact same arms, uh, this identical Claudin-6 binding and CD3 binding arms. And what you see here is we show the cytotoxicity for the CTIM-76 versus the bite. CTIM-76 is more potent. And we also see cytokine release for these two sets of molecules for the CTIM-76 in red and the bite molecules in blue. And we see that we have a good uh, um, uh, uh, separation between cytotoxicity and cytokine release um, in CTIM-76 uh, that is equivalent to or superior to the separation we see for the bite molecules, saying that we should have a, a good range of doses that we can um, uh, work with um, as we um, develop this molecule. But I think the biggest concern was, uh, was specificity and where we really um, were, were um, go, you know, really were, were trying to have the most optimal arm as, as we could. As mentioned, Claudin, uh, Claudin 6 only differs by, from Claudin 9 by three amino acids. And so getting that specificity for Claudin 6 versus Claudin 9 was, was uh, paramount for the success of this program. So we, um, you know, our molecule, the uh, parental IgG molecule, which is IM301, which is shown on the right, shows good specificity uh, for Claudin 6 in red versus the other Claudins. Claudins and has a rather unique epitope um, um, shown in the figure. On the left is IMAP27. This was the uh, Claudin-6 um, antibody that was uh, developed by uh, Ganymed, later, uh, later uh, um, licensed by Astellas. Um, somewhat different epitope uh, from IM301 from the CTIM76 Claudin-6 binding arm. And as you can see, while there is some specificity for Claudin-6, um, over over Claudin 9, um, there still is uh, extensive binding uh, Claudin 9 of this molecule, in, at least in the IgG format. We wanted to dive down into this further, looking at these, looking at the Claudin 6 binding in the CTIM76 molecule itself. 
So what you see here on the left is, C is the binding of CTIM76 to Claudin6 expressing cells. And, and it has a really strong uh, nat nanomolar, slightly sub-nanomolar binding uh, to Claudin6. On the right is the binding that we see to Claudin9. And as you can see, up to one micromolar, we see no binding uh, to, to Claudin9 for CTIM76, giving us um, um, you know, several orders of magnitude of, uh, of, of um, specificity. But binding wasn't sufficient for us. And we know that, that particularly in, in T cell engagers, um, they can, the cytotoxicity can be very sensitive to low levels of off-target binding. And so we didn't wanna just trust the specificity that we saw in binding. We wanted to go on to cytotoxicity assays to really, um, uh, to really uh, dig down into this. So what you see here are cytotoxicity assays on cells that are expressing Claudin-6, Claudin-9, Claudin-4, and Claudin-3. Claudin-6 by cytotoxicity, as we mentioned before, is, is in the sub-picomolar range, so very, very potent. Claudin-9, Claudin-4, and Claudin-3, although we saw in the binding in our binding states, actually do show um, some level of cytotoxicity. And while this is a thousand fold, roughly uh, three orders of magnitude difference in the cytotox that we see for Claudin-6, there, uh, there are uh, doses where you will see uh, cytotoxicity against these other Claudins. And this is, you know, this really is a good take home message, which is binding can show you specificity, but, you know, functional assays can be much more sensitive, much more sensitive. And even though you may not see Binding, see, see binding to these off targets. It's only by testing in cytotoxicity assays that you can really uh, convince yourself that the specificity that you're seeing is, is what you need. So let me just tell you sort of uh, sort of summarize this data and tell you where the next steps are. Um, we, we're seeing encouraging efficacy uh, signals where um, stenograph studies are, are ongoing right now, but we're seeing encouraging signals. And uh, we're seeing selectivity across you know, both binding and cytotoxicity in vitro, as I showed you in the previous slide. Um, the tolerability uh, studies, the safety studies are, are beginning. So we're seeing no significant safety findings to date. Um, we, you know, as we showed in the cytokine release assays, we see preferential cytotoxicity over activation of, of, of cytokines telling us that we should be able to find doses which, which have that good, uh, um, um, uh, good cytotoxicity and uh, minimize um, any safety concerns. And the PK is consistent with an IgG backbone. Once again, one of the advantages of the CTIM76 format. And we're making good progress towards the clinic. So IND enabling studies are ongoing and the IND submission uh, is expected in Q1 of 2024. And at this, I'll hand back to uh, Marty Lip. So when, when we think about how one should view Claudin-6 in the context of there being a lot of interesting cancer targets out there. There, unfortunately in the world are a lot of different cancers and we view, you know, there's a fundamental unmet need in almost all of them, but there's a lot of opportunities. And ACR is a great example where many companies are presenting many different ideas. And the lens that we typically think about for interesting cancer targets is through two matrices. So how big is the total addressable market, which is the uh, horizontal axis? And then the vertical axis would be how validated is that target? And so sometimes there's very new science where we don't know a whole lot about what's going on with the biology. That would be an emerging target. And then on the far end, there are validated targets, things where there are clinically approved drugs. In the case of Claudin-6, uh, our competitor BioNTech has publicly reported on 21 patients worth of data in testicular and ovarian cancer showing very, very promising efficacy where they're shrinking tumors in about 50% of the patients. Uh, and if you look at the total addressable market, as my colleague Eric showed earlier on, we think there's you know, directionally 62,000 or more patients in the United States alone who have caught in six positive cancers. So there's a really large opportunity for this novel interesting target. As we think about how one might therapeutically exploit Claudin-6, we think really bispecifics and CAR-T, uh, so the immunotherapies, 
are the strategies that are likely to yield the highest uh, success. In the case of monoclonal antibodies, Quadin 6 does not have a ton of signaling activity. And so a monoclonal would have limited activity. And that's been shown clinically by Estellus. Secondarily, we also do not believe that antibody drug conjugates uh, would make for good Quadin 6 therapeutics. And really, there's, there's three reasons for that. So first, uh, we disclosed in December in an R&D webinar that one of the key criteria for antibody drug conjugate success is to get the antibody drug conjugate into the cell of the tumor, which is referred to as internalization. We do not see Quadin 6 as being a protein that internalizes, at least in our hands. Secondarily, we know that Quadin 6 functions to uh, enable cells to attach to one another. And there's a lot of quad and six expressed per cell in cancer cells, about 500,000 copies. And so with this high quad and six expression, the cancer cells bind really tightly to one another, forming this almost impenetrable bar, uh, ball. That makes it very hard for drugs to get deep into the tumor. And so one of the ways the antibody drug conjugates work is by binding the surface, not actually internalizing, but just releasing drug near the tumor, hoping that it gets in. And we think that's unlikely to be successful, given that these tumors are chemo resistant and bound so tightly. And then the last thing that, that gives us reservations about ADCs is the fact that a company called Stemcentrix put an ADC in the clinic uh, and it had very substantial toxicity due to off-target binding to Quadin 9. And this is a good transition slide. As we think about our competitors and their selectivity profiles for Quadin 6, they actually look quite similar to Stemcentrics. All that being said, a group from UCLA formed a company called Toral, T-O-R-L, Biotherapeutics, that announced a $158 million round uh, on Friday. So, and that, that round was led by Goldman Sachs with participation from well-known funds such as Perceptive uh, and Deep Track Capital. And then actually Bristol Myers Squibb participated uh, in that financing. So it's a great uh, day for Quadin 6 when uh, a major pharmaceutical in BMS and several of the top biotech uh, specialist funds are betting on, on Quadin 6 as a therapeutic modality. So we really think that bispecifics uh, though afford the best approach in this area. And we really view it as having a limited competition set uh, therein. Uh, we believe that Amgen is our primary competitor, at least as it relates to selectivity. Uh, and they've only disclosed selectivity versus Quadin 9. And as my colleagues mentioned earlier, Quadin's 3, 4, and 9 are all important off targets for Quadin 6 by specifics and therapeutics in general. And so we think we are differentiated based on selectivity. And we are very interested to see Amgen as they disclose more data about their selectivity profile uh, going forward. So it's still very early days. And we get questions a lot of how far behind are you uh, from other people. Uh, Amgen just opened their trial last month. BioNTech has dosed 21 patients. So it's still early days. I think we absolutely have an opportunity uh, to catch up uh, to the major players here uh, and start generating uh, additional data. So slide 26 just is a summary of, of what I uh, outlined. Uh, and so to, to take it home, the field is emerging. We think Quadin 6 is a really novel, important target that one should consider for solid tumors. And the Toral financing raising 158 million from well-respected biotech specialist funds as well as Bristol Myers, I think further helps provide external validation for uh, the target. So with that, uh, I'll pause here and I'm gonna turn the dialogue over to my colleague, Sue Romanoff from our investor relations firm, Edison, to guide uh, a discussion. We got a number of, of questions during the conversation. And so maybe we'll go one by one uh, and have my colleagues, Joe and Eric, address them. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, please enter them through the Q&A portal at the bottom of the Zoom panel. Uh, we'll just go through a, a few of these here right now. Uh, 
um, what defines high and low Claudine expression and how is this validated? I can handle that one. So different publications have looked at that in a number of different ways. It's been looked at by RNA and by IHC. Um, we think that RNA expression parallels pretty closely to protein expression. And the work that we've done has used a number of different cell lines where we think that the uh, number of antibody binding sites ranges from about 500,000 at the high end to something like 50,000 at the low end. And we see um, good CTL activity in that whole range with different EC50s, depending on how many targets there are per cell. Um, here, here's another one. Uh, given the phenotype similarities of Claudine six with other Claudine molecules, so is there mean. any any signals to suggest risks evidence of off tumor organ toxo uh, toxicities? Also, what kind of risks of uh, cytokine release syndrome based on cytokine profiling? So we've looked at um, where we start to see in vitro. We've looked to see where we see cytokine production as opposed to killing. And in the in vitro assays that we've done, we see about a uh, two log shift in the cytokine production versus the killing. So we think we have a pretty big window in terms of where we should see um, effective target killing and where we would begin to see real, um, significant release of cytokines in vivo. And then in terms of uh, um, off tumor um, toxicities, we think that they should be minimal with Claudin-6, um, where we have good specificity. Um, the uh, the uh, BioNTech CAR T-cell approach showed a little bit of toxicity, but nothing too serious. And a lot of that was liver toxicity. And we suspect that some of that may be due to the, um, the um, vaccine boost that they were doing and the nanoparticles Many of them will be caught up in the liver, so you'll get liver expression of Claudin-6, which would render that system susceptible to some liver damage. Uh, for testicular cancer, uh, it has a high ex um, expression of Claudin-6, even though in smaller end mark, uh, it is a smaller end market. How feasible it is, to, is it to dominate the indication with uh, CTIM-76 given other therapies available? Yep, I, I can handle that one. So testicular is a great example where uh, by and large, it's caught early. 95% uh, of the patients will be cured via surgery. And so the real challenge is when it comes back. And at that point, there are very few treatment options. If you look at historical response rates, meaning the percent of patients who see their tumor shrink with a particular therapy, you know, testicular, you're looking at the high end, maybe 15 to 20% of patients having a response. And what BioNTech showed was 50%. Now there are CAR T therapy, that's a $2 million treatment. Uh, and so convincing an insurer to pay for something like that uh, is a, a steep hill to climb. Uh, in our case, you know, we really do believe bispecifics can mirror that activity, uh, but do it in a manner that is much, much more cost effective. Uh, for insurers and much easier for, for patients. So there's a variety of strategies in drug development. Some companies go after the largest indications, the largest market size. Those are typically the most competitive, most expensive ways to go about. Some view a beachhead strategy. So you pick a very small cancer like testicular, you try to go for a quick approval, and then you build out from there. Uh, we have not disclose what our development strategy will be, but we have disclosed that testicular ovarian and non-small cell lung are uh, at the top of our, our list right now. Great. Maybe, Joe, um, were, were other cytokines aside from TNF and INF evaluated since it's likely that other cytokine drivers CR, uh, drives CRS, IL-6, IL-7, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we, we did test other uh, other cytokines. For example, we looked at IL-6 and IL-2 and others, and the profiles we saw with those cytokines were, were quite similar to, this, to the profiles we saw with TNF-alpha and, and interferon gamma. Um, as we, you know, move this project forward, of course, we, we can expand into other, other, other cytokines. I saw some interesting posters at AACR, for example, IL-8, 
um, with, with, with regards to uh, T cell engagers. So I think, you know, as we move forward, we can expand to additional cytokines, but we, we have looked at IL-6, for example. Uh, what is the frequency of antigen escape of Claudine 9 after antigen pressure from cars or bites? Uh, given the depth of clinical experience right now, it's impossible to say. So BioNTech's had 21 people on their bite so far um, without long-range follow-up. Uh, Amgen's only just started their clinical trial, so that remains to be seen. Um, maybe, Martin, uh, wh why not partner with Amgen and pool resources? Uh, you know, if Amgen shows up with a big check, that, that seems very reasonable. Um, but pithy comments aside, you know, the fundamental challenge we have in front of us is BioNTech and Amgen are very substantial competitors, not just from a, a capital-based standpoint, but from a resource standpoint. And so one of the things that we're evaluating as a company is uh, we've guided that we have capital in the late 2024. Maybe we can extend that a, a little bit uh, beyond that through creative means, but to really compete with the larger companies a substantial way, we'll either need incremental capital, a partner, or potentially sell the asset. And so all those paths are being evaluated uh, and will continue to be so in the, the future. Okay, great. I mean, uh, if, if anybody else has any other questions, otherwise um, we can uh, um, wrap this up, Martin. There was one additional question is testicular and orphan indication, and it, it is an orphan indication. And so okay. for those of you who are familiar with orphan, that's a potential regulatory designation to uh, have increased uh, regulatory interactions with the FDA, a potential accelerated path toward drug approval, and then a company, should the drug get approved, is eligible for R&D tax credits that are retroactive. That's all the questions that we have time for today. Thank you for taking time to join. If you have any additional questions or would you like to speak to the management team, don't hesitate to reach out to the contact information on the context website. Thank you. Mm -hmm.